Welcome to the Better Business, Better Life show. I'm your podcast host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor. In this podcast, I interview business owners, EOS implementers, and business experts who share with you their experiences, tips, and tools to help you create not only a better business, but also a better life. At the end of each show, you will have three tips or tools that our guests share that you can implement immediately into your life. If you want more information or want to get in contact, you can visit my website, debra.coach. That's D-E-B-R-A dot coach. Please enjoy the show. Today, I'm joined by Sean Hayes, who is a best-selling author, a speaker, an entrepreneur, and a felon. So as you can imagine, we're going to have some very interesting discussions this morning. Welcome to the show, Sean. Oh, thank you, Deborah. I cannot wait to talk to you and your audience. Uh, I'm looking forward to it too. So we've had a little bit of a chat beforehand and um, your story is an interesting one because if you read about what you've done, you know, you've had the the absolute ultimate highs and then potentially the ultimate lows as well. So would you share with us a bit of your journey, please, Sean? I will. I, I, there's a saying in life I'd like to start with because it's so true to my life. Seldom do people realize their greatest dreams or their worst fears. And I would say I'm probably one of your few guests who can honestly say I've realize my greatest dreams beyond them and fears uh, uh, worse than I could ever imagine. So thank you. Um, well, in, in the States, I like to say I'm a dumb Southern Missouri boy. I grew up in the country. Um, and, um, if, and, and the only thing I can draw it to is Budweiser beer and uh, St. Louis Cardinal baseball is where I ended up. But um, as a child, I was an entrepreneur and my, my parents were just, I like to tell business people this, they never told me what to do. My mother was entrepreneurial. My father was. They were both successful. But I was a disappointment because I became a banker. Okay. And in the States, there's only, if you're in small business, there's only two, and I say people, but two entities who really hold you accountable. The IRS, internal revenue, you have to pay taxes, and your banker because they say no a lot. And um, so when I went into banking, uh, a family friend said, at least you'll learn how to borrow money. And uh, I was very fortunate because I started 41 years ago and the industry was changing. It was a sales culture. And uh, before that, as we jokingly said, it was called 363. You paid 3% on deposits, you charged 6% on loans, and you teed off to play golf at 3 in the afternoon. <laughs> By the way, I play golf. But, um, but the point is, is that I came into the industry when it was fun and, uh, and we were salespeople. We went out, we, we sold money. That was our primary thing. And of course, it's a little unique in most products or services because we wanted it back, you know, with interest. And um, I spent seven years with a large bank based in Kansas City, Missouri. And after seven years, and you're going to learn very quickly, Deborah, I'm not the brightest bulb in the tree. After seven years, I realized my last name wasn't Kemper. And for 76 years before, and 34 years after, every CEO has had one last name, and it was Kemper. So at 29, I went out and bought a bank with, put a group of people together. Banking in the States is very different than the rest of the world. When I got into it, there were 21,000. Wow. Today, we still have 5,000. So it's very different than most countries experience. It's very entrepreneurial. Mm. And... Um, we started out, and I love to tell this story uh, to your audience because this will give you an idea. This teaches a lot. I, I have a YouTube video, and I talk about culture, and I talk the stories about cash, and you're going to find out I'm crazy. Um, we buy this bank, and it had a $1,150,000 in cash. Ten years later, I didn't have a bank that had 50000 in it, and the ATMs had more than that the way things have changed. But we sit down and, and what here Fed funds, which is overnight investing, were like 9%. And we're thinking, wow, if we took three quarters of a million dollars and took it to the Federal Reserve, we'd make like five, $6,000 more a month. And we're trying to make more money. And so I picked up the phone and I called Brinks, the armored car people. And I said, could you send an armored car? And they said, yeah, it'll be $250. Well, I, I said, I'll call you back. And I went into my partner and I said, you know, they're going to charge $250. Now, what I didn't tell you was it's October, which for here is late fall. It's very dark. 
And I drove 168 miles one way to work. So that should tell your business people, I believe entrepreneurship is about commitment. Mm -hmm. And so I said, let's load it in the trunk of my car. So unlike, yeah, I can see your face, unlike in the movies where they take a million dollars and it's a briefcase, I had a car and literally it was like this by the time we put three quarters of a million dollars in it. I drove 168 miles, about a hundred of it on two lane roads, got home, unloaded it, put it in my family room. We slept with it, got up the next morning, and took it to Fed. The point was, when you're, when you're an entrepreneur in your business stuff, you have to have a culture that teaches people how much you care about the value of a dollar in this country. On one hand, on the other hand, how can you make another dollar? And that was the story of our company. Unlike other banks in the world, we grew 80 fold over, over um, 12 years, but we really grew 50 fold over nine years. Wow. And that's that's tech company growth. And yeah. along the way, we went public. And uh, I, as CEO, I every quarter, my earnings were better than the quarter before. And in the States, that's very important. So we had this darling track record of exceeding expectations and of a astronomical growth. You know, most banks in this country during that time were happy growing 6 or 8%. And we were growing, you know, literally you know, 50% a year. It was crazy. And it was so much fun. And then as all good things, it came to an end as it should have. <clears throat> when you're, in a, when you're in, a, in a business relationship for 15 years with the same group of people, it's hard. And it was just a natural time. And one of the, lar the seventh largest bank in America showed up. And at that time, we were a two and a half billion dollar bank. And they were 110 billion. And they bought us for a whole lot of money. And I spent four years with a large bank like that, being one of the top 35 people in a company of 36,000. And I learned there this, in a big company, you don't have to do anything right, but God forbid you do one thing wrong. And that's very counterintuitive to those of us who are in business for ourselves. We get out there every day and we try things. We try things, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we fail. Sometimes we change our minds and make a different decision. In a big company, as I used to tell my oldest son, it's like trying to turn an aircraft carrier around in a river. It's impossible. Yep. And um, so I did that for about four years. And then a little thing happened called the 2008-9 uh, recession. Mm -hmm. And literally that bank failed. And oh. uh, they got bought. They were $42 a share. And they got bought for like $2 a share. Now, in my world, that's failure. Um, in, 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 the, uh, in the economic world, as we saw Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and, and, um, and some other banks fail here about six months ago, they didn't fail. They just got bought over the weekend for nothing. Well, mm -hmm. that's what them. And, and in my terminology, I use, I caught a falling knife. I was heavily invested in bank stock and I was losing millions of dollars a week. And I'd also made my fortune, although I made a lot of money in banking, I really made it in real estate, and I was in a real estate business. And I owned three large positions in smaller banks. And I just didn't realize how bad things were. And, uh, and what happened was um, I had seen a man um, become very successful. I bought my first bank from him. I'd known him from years before that, who had bought defaulted assets and put them in a bank. And so I structured a transaction that was legal and perfectly structured. And at the last, at the 11th hour, um, it wasn't going to go through because one of the defaulted borrowers, I was in a loan that was at one of the banks that were selling them to us at a deep discount. And uh, I was a partner. <laughs> Excuse me. And in the United States, if you own more than, in this case, I own 54% of the bank, but if you own more than 10%, and I never banked with myself, my own company anyway, mm -hmm. impossible to do business with yourself. And that's a law that I broke. 
and I knew when I did it, I had done it. The reason why I did it was, and as I said to you before we started, it's most decisions are made made on fear and greed. And the greed was my bank was going to make a lot of money. The fear was that I was losing money so fast I needed things to go well. And had the transaction run its course, run its course as it had dozens and dozens of times before when I'd done this, not with my own, with not with a piece, not with a small piece that I was involved in it wouldn't have been a problem. Well, Mm -hmm. it became a problem. And, uh, and that's what, uh, that's what uh, sent me to prison. And, uh, and what I like to talk about is you, you know, your audience are people like myself then. And, and quite honestly, as it says in the book and back, and uh, I've just had an unbelievable rise again, not like the first time it's very different, but it's for me, it's far more fun. And uh, I told you earlier, I like to say uh, to your listeners, I wouldn't chase one thing. Now, am I happy that I damaged my my relationship with my children? No. Am I happy that I lost 37 months of my life and freedom? No. Am I happy that I lost millions of dollars? No. Am I happy that I lost friends and I hurt people? No. But I'm such a better person for it. And what I learned in this whole journey is, is that I always knew business was about people because I've seen 10,000 business plans and I've never seen one fail. You know, I've never seen one where they plan to fail. Yet I've seen hundreds and hundreds of companies fail. And it's always the same thing. It's execution. And execution is dependent upon people. You can even be, as a man told me when I started, he goes, Sean, you're so talented when I was 29. Why are you, why are you buying a bank? Why don't you go into another business? You can be in an industry like banking that's in a long-term cyclical decline and still succeed if you have the right people to execute. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate that I did. And the key to my success as I, as I got through it, not when I was going through it, as I got through it, I realized it was in a, it was in having a very diverse and intelligent board of directors. And in particular, in my case, it was in having four people and myself on an executive committee, uh, one woman and three other men, who helped me accountable constantly, at least Mm -hmm. two to four times, two to four times a month, if not every week we met. And we talked on the phone in those days. Today, we would have emailed a lot more or text. But it's just amazing when you're around people who are smart and who can look at a problem. And I've never been someone who's a fan of groupthink. But I do love when you pull a group and you get their ideas. And at the end of the day, someone in the, in the case of my company, I made the decisions. But it wasn't without wise counsel. It wasn't where it's run. You know, there's nothing like an entity run by a committee. Look at our government. We run everything by a committee. Now, it beats, it beats a dictatorship or, you know, socialism, anything like that. But you really, at the end of the day, someone has to be accountable. And it's up to people around you to hold you accountable. And um, and that's the lesson I learned from this. And if people don't take anything else from this, this uh, podcast, but this, it truly is surround yourself with really bright people who they don't have to be from your industry necessarily, but they need to have experiences. And I like to talk about the woman. She'd been director of a, of a bank that we ended up passing in size, which was much larger, very successful bank. And she'd been their HR director. And I would let Virginia interview people who reported to me or that I interacted with a lot. And she was, and this is one of the most valuable lessons I learned. And there's one other one I want to pass along. But this one was, Sean, you're going to love Deborah. She's going to do a great job. She's the person for the job. But you, Sean, have to get over these two things. Because she taught me I can't change people. And that if I wanted to get the result I wanted, and I had somebody as talented as you are and as bright and as hardworking, I had to work around things that might not have appealed to me about your style. Mm -hmm. Because we all want to change people. And she said, you're going to fail trying to change them. You change yourself because you want that result. That was the best advice I got. The second best advice I got And this is something that all your listeners, when they really think about it, they'll be right. You're not your own customer. And 
I there's a bank here called Northern Trust, <coughs> or the original J.P. Morgan, not J.P. Morgan Chase. And if you've been to those banks, they are the most phenomenal wood millwork, stone, marble, just just really fortresses of institutions. In the third, and I've owned eighty or ninety banks, but in the thirty-eight that I sold for a half a billion dollars that we started our first acquisition, we paid 3.3 million and we sold out for a half a billion. Our, we never built a new building. I never bought new office furniture. We, we turned a Kentucky fried chicken and a Hardee's into a bank because they have drive throughs But we would buy a bank and we literally went shopping and I would walk through and if you were one of my senior people, you go, Sean, I want that table. And I go, Deborah, I'm taking that picture. And Karen Box behind us might say, I want that sofa. And Tom Diver would say, I want that desk. We had a hodgepodge of first because our, our customers didn't care what our banks looked like. They wanted service and price. Mm -hmm. and if I had built that bank for myself, we wouldn't have been so successful. So I always will challenge your audience to look at and say, who's your customer? It's about your customer. Because once you think it's about you, you start making some really bad decisions and you make bad investments in your business. And that's what causes you to fail in the execution. So um, you told me to talk for a little while and I'm, I'm, as I, and I want your audience to know, there's not one question off, off limits in this conversation. So uh, keep leading me down the path, ma'am. Perfect. Thank you. There's a lot there to absorb. And I've written a few little notes here about things that have, have struck me. Um, I think the first thing is, you know, people, you're absolutely right. You know, people kind of make or break things and they are the execution. Um, the work that I do is all about helping people harness that people energy and, and putting it in some kind of order. You said that you, you know, you got um, Virginia to kind of also interview these people uh, that you were looking to hire. What else did you do to make sure you got the right people on board? Well, my, my biggest lesson is don't be afraid to hire people from out of your industry mm -hmm. <clears throat> because we all get in this, well, they have this experience or that experience in our industry. And industry knowledge is important. But we were a company that grew in our, in our huge growth years were 1993 to 2001. And we had a huge technological advantage that I believe still exists. Exist. Small companies don't have to have huge investments in technology. You can buy stuff off the shelf. You can spend less money because you're agile. Mm -hmm. And so we hired a tech person who knew nothing about banking. The woman who ran our technology, she was a tech person. So we didn't have these preconceived notions. Our larger competitors, it would be many times our size, they had hundreds of millions of dollars in antiquated platforms that they kept perpetuating because they couldn't afford to write them off. We could change the, you know, the biggest, you know, the biggest investment we made was in 1997. And that's one of my favorite failure stories. And it, and I, and I write it in the book, but we, the most we ever spent at one time was a million seven. So, you know, we didn't have these big investments. We, you know, we might buy a $40,000 piece of software or a $400,000 piece of hardware. And we did things. The other thing we did, and I'm not a fan of consultants, and I was, I was talking to a business owner last weekend who lives in Chicago. And I said, I only use consultants on this basis. You give me your advice, you track it, and I'll pay you based on what I make or what I save. I'm not paying you for your time. And I was three for three in that because in this country, forget before snail mail, as your generation calls it, went away. We quit mailing stuff. We, 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 we didn't send bank statements. We didn't, so we, we first didn't send checks. Then we did things. We, we were giving out debit cards in the mid nineties before every, now then that's the only way to transaction. I went to a football game last night, American football, and they didn't take cash. <clears throat> we adapted to technology very well, but we did those things because the people that ran our technology weren't bankers. They were technology people. And um, I was uh, with um, my girlfriend today and we were, we saw some Britannica cyclopedias 
And I'll never forget in 1994, I got my first PC at home and it had the cyclopedia on it. Mm-hmm. And it was just, it blew me away that it was all just on a disc. Yep. And I got that because the IT people weren't bankers. And I said, I want to buy a computer. What should I buy? What kind of software? And it changed my mindset. So you've got to, you've got to hire people outside of your industry if you're going to be successful because you get that, that group think that everybody did, you know, we did it this way. And I mentioned to you before we started, if I ever told my board when they said, why do we do this? If I ever said it's because of the way we've always done it, that generally meant we changed it. And change is good. Change is hard. But, you know, I, I like to tell your listeners this, and I know they know this. If you don't adapt and change every day, and by the way, human beings are the most adaptable species ever. If you don't do those things, you're going to lose. You have to change every day. You have to look at how you do things. And that's just part of it. You know, make cha- be a change leader. Have a change culture. And I also believe those who are owners or CEOs or whatever moniker they put on themselves, they're the chief culture carrier. And I told you culture I created by putting three quarters of a million dollars in my trunk. But one time we'd acquired a bank and they had a fortune in stationery. And I parked in the bank of the building by the back of the building by the dumpster because I wanted a culture where everybody knew that I what didn't have a special parking place and all this. I went in the back door and it was misty and all in, in those days there were so many smokers and they could only smoke out in the back. And I literally crawled in a dumpster and started handing stationery out because it was going to ruin. We're going to throw it away. And I wouldn't, I would buy anything but post-its. I don't (laughs) like post-its. So the joke was for your birthday, your coworkers would give you post-its and for holidays, you would give them post-its. But I had them made into notepads. You know, it was that culture of we don't throw things away. We're not wasteful. Mm -hmm. And those are things that made us successful. Oh, I love it. I love the encyclopedia thing too. I actually have in my session room, I actually have a whole set of encyclopedias just to remind us of, about the, the changes that we see in the world. Um, now, you've also talked about, you know, you're not your own customer. And I think that's a really valid thing. I used to do a lot of work around market validation with various companies and, and you know, they would, they, would, they would often base the decisions on what they wanted. And you'd have to say to them, look, you know, if your target audience is a um, 23-year-old male, um, I'm not a 23-year-old male so I cannot possibly think like a 23 year old male and so I'd encourage them to actually go out and talk to customers and really get a sense of what those customers wanted and not not lead them down a path either actually allow them to come up with what they genuinely wanted and then see how you develop things for it how do you how did you keep that front of mind in your business how do you make sure that you don't fall into the trap of what you would like to see two two for one anecdotal constantly talk to your customers second I think investing in peer group and in data where, you know, where you can, I've sat behind many smoke glass wall and listened to people sit around a table. And when, when the company I was with, which was the largest bank in Kansas city and in St. Louis, we didn't have much market share. And we sat there night after night and they never mentioned us. That told me everything. When you, when the people in the market don't even, when the facilitator finally has to bring out the name of the company, not who's hosting it, but have you thought of this institution or not? That tells you. So you can, that's that market data is so important, in, in because we do that. You, you know, it's it's anecdotal things. It's it's having. And you said this. I'm not a 23 year old male. You're not a 23 year old male. It's also having a diverse management team. Mm-hmm. Um, I had I mentioned my HR was a female. My IT was a female. At the same time, when I bought my second bank, because that's when I came into the metropolitan area. I immediately put blacks and women on the board because if you're not diverse, you don't understand your customers. You know, in St. Louis, you have about 20% of your, 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 your market are African-Americans. If you have nothing but a bunch of, forget that there's over 50% females, but if you've got boring white men like myself, you're not going to understand either one of those markets. And, um, and that's, you're not your own customer. The other mistake people make is they worry about what their competitors doing. And I never cared what my competitor did. I didn't follow him. I didn't chase him. And I, I was listening to a, a man speak, an excellent speaker, a few months ago. And he'd been hired by, by Apple to consult them. And he said the entire time 
they didn't ask one question about Microsoft and they competed directly in this space. They were focused on customer, customer, customer. He said a few months later, he went to Microsoft in the whole day, they want to talk about Apple. 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 <laughs> and that's my argument. You, yeah. you stay focused on the customer, not the competitor. Yeah, I completely agree. And there's a lot of um, authors who agree with you as well. It's just, it makes no sense. It's like there's plenty of opportunities out there. Um, do what your customer wants and needs. I'm really curious. You said I could ask any question. 37 months. Did I get that right? Is that how long you were incarcerated for? Yes, ma'am. Tell me a little bit about that, because that must have been um, lots of time to reflect, I should imagine. Uh, it, it literally 16 hours a day. And uh, it's um, in this in the, in the U.S., it's unique. In my experience, was unique to any other people. I'm what's called a white collar criminal. But I spent 17 months in a county jail. And in the, in, the, in the U.S., the feds. The federal government, they put you, they house you in county institutions. And most people, they go straight from the courtroom to a white collar camp. Mm -hmm. I spent six months in a county jail where literally every day, I, you never sit down to eat other than breakfast because you had to be able to move to either fight or flee because right. it's, it's not a pretty place. But it was a time where I literally walked down a 54 foot hallway a thousand times a day. That's how I, I didn't watch TV. I didn't play cards. I read because I've always been a reader and I focused on myself and, uh, and what was I going to do with my life and how was I going to change it? And, um, and it was, it was a humbling. Uh, but then again, I wouldn't trade any of that because I'm a better person for it. So tell me, you said you did a lot of reading. Was um, was it mostly business books? I mean, you said that your mum and dad were entrepreneurs. You're brought up an entrepreneur. Uh, what did you read while you were? Well, and, the, and I'm glad you was before prison, I, I read, you know, banking kind of things. But I only read Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, which I think is a must read for anyone. I don't know if you've read it. Have, but to yeah. me, the greatest book. But I read all those other ones. You know, I read, you know, you name something uh, out there. I've now read it, in, including War and Peace and, um, and some other very, I've always been a student of history. And I, I think in business, you have to be. I think you have to understand because it does repeat itself. And, and I always, I, I have five children and my number two son, I would always say there hasn't been a new thought in 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And I've now lived a lot old enough to see Pleats come and go in men's clothes, cuffs and pants, <clears throat> ties narrow and widen in return. And so I think in history, but all those books that everybody recommends, I've read. One that I would encourage your business owners to read, that's not a business book, it's called Boundaries. It's about okay. 30 and it's been, and it's, it's sold millions of copy, copies. It's by two psychologists and it's about boundaries. And I'm a better business person now because I read that book. And, um, you know, a lot of those re those reflective things and interpersonal things, because I always said, starting about 20 years ago, my undergraduate degree is in finance. My graduate's in finance. I'm boring. If I had it to do over, I would have had psychology and finance because mm -hmm. It's all about getting in people's head. It's understanding organizational behavior, person, and boundaries teaches you a lot about that. And and I think that's important because how we set boundaries, it costs me freedom on one hand. On the other hand, I'm now a better business person because I set much better boundaries. Mm, I agree. I actually um, <laughs> I use this a lot in my sessions with people when I actually explain that humans enjoy having boundaries, right? It gives us some structure. It gives us something we know we're going to work within. And I use the example of a little seedling kind of growing in the middle of a paddock full of cows. And what happens to that seedling if you haven't got some fencing around that that seedling? It will never get the chance to actually grow into what it needs to be. And then once it reaches the stage of being a big fully grown tree, um, it's protected from those cows. But those boundaries are the things that actually enables it 
to um, to grow into what it can become. So it's a it's a topic I, I love in terms of I just think you know people don't like to put boundaries in, thinking that people might not like them because of it. But mostly we genuinely appreciate having knowing where those boundaries are. This is a, and then you touched on. I agree, completely agree with everything you said. A few years ago, I was in a meeting, and um, and someone basically said I wasn't a nice person. <clears throat> I said to them, they call me a, an SOB. And, and in the old days, I would have immediately challenged, attacked, retaliated. And I said, let me think about that. And I came back to the next monthly meeting. And I said, you know, you're right. And it's because I can say no. And it's because I make decisions that people don't like. But I think I'm making the best decisions for my organization or for myself. And that's why I think boundaries are just what you said, that they, they, they give people the opportunity to not make everybody happy. But I think to be successful, you can't try to make everyone happy. Yeah, absolutely. You've got to go for the greater good. Um, it's kind of why I have a number of soft toys in my room as well. I use one of them as the elephant in the room. It's like the elephant in the room is actually we're here for the greater good and we can't keep everybody happy. And sometimes it's not decision by committee. It's actually about what is the best thing for the organisation. And, and that's how you have to make decisions. Um, the next thing I wanted to ask you was around, you know, so you... <laughs> You got put into prison. Um, I, I don't know if you knew at that point when you would be released or what that would look like, but did you have any idea what you were going to do when you came out, or was that something that developed over time? Well, I uh, one, I knew I, I didn't. I never, in my mind, and I love this, and I know your audience can res will resonate with them, I've never felt like I had a job in my life. Mm -hmm. I spent seven years with a big company, and then I ran my own company. Even the four years I spent in a much larger company, I didn't feel constrained and I had a quote job. So I didn't want a job. And uh, and while I was in prison, I actually started a business outside with some people. And um, so it, it's one of those things where um, I think you're either an entrepreneur or you're not. And I think that you can make a choice to be one, but most people don't and that's okay too. It'd be a very boring world if they didn't, you know, if we were all the same. But once you're an entrepreneur, how can you not want to get back in the fight? Yeah. And uh, <laughs> love the game. You know, it's uh, it, the things that are important to me now are different than what were important before, but it's still winning the game. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think it's important. And I thought it was important when I was incarcerated to, you know, how do I redefine myself? Well, I redefine myself by what I do when I get out. And if I just go be, a drone that I'm not and do something that I'm not, I won't ever redefine myself. Yep. Okay. And so you, you were in prison, you were reading your books, you were thinking about sort of what came next. Did you have any kind of epiphanies? Um, Cause I, I think one of the things we talk about is like actually taking time out and being still and having the time to allow things to settle can actually give you real clarity of thought. And I know when I did Outward Bound when I was in my early 40s, it was really challenging in terms of I was the oldest, fattest, unfittest person there. Um, but we had to do this sort of two-day, uh, what they call solitary confinement, where they, they make you kind of sit down and you write yourself a letter. And it was probably the first time in a long, long time that I actually got to sit there and just be and there was no distractions from technology there was nothing going on and I had these most amazing kind of thoughts come to my mind because I had the time to actually be still you had a lot of time to I had two days you had 37 months you had a lot of time to kind of um, potentially be still and, and think and I and, and, and it's, it's 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 ironic you asked that no one else has but you are on target and I one of the key things I came away with and if, if you know me, I'm an unbelievably fast thinker. Mm -hmm. And that's a good, ad, a good attribute. But what I learned was to think about my thinking. And mm -hmm. it doesn't slow me down, but maybe a second or two. But I make such better decisions when I think about my thinking. I'm much better in relationships when I think about my thinking. And that was the epiphany is just take those milliseconds or seconds Keep being a fast thinker, but think about your thinking and analyze your thinking before you say it, before you think it, before you type it, before you text it, before you write it down. And so I'm a much better decision maker and I'm much better in relationships 
because I think about my thinking better. And I, I believe that's a segue to what I learned is you hear life's a journey, you hear it's a marathon, but when you have 37 months to think about every day of your life, and if you get to know me, I'm one of those people that can kind of tell you what I've done every day of my life, you realize it is a marathon. Mm. And there was a study in the States 30 years ago, and um, it was octogenarians. And one of the things, the only four things came to the top. And, and the one that was relevant to me is they would have done things differently had they realized they were going to live so long. And I don't think when we're younger, we think that we're going to be 40 one day and 50 one day and 60 one day. And in their cases, 80 one day. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a real driver. And when you have that in mind at one end and you think about what you're thinking at the other, you make much better decisions and you're a much better individual. Completely agree. That's fantastic. I've got written that down. Think about my thinking. I think it's a really um, fair point for because most entrepreneurs tend to be sort of reasonably fast paced, reasonably quick in their thinking. Um, I have to say, I as I've grown older and hopefully a wee bit more mature, I'm not too sure how more mature, but I can catch myself now. Um, I used to be a bit of a keyboard warrior. And if somebody would send me an email or a text message, I would respond almost immediately. And often the responses that I had were not necessarily the best responses. And now I catch myself. You can tell when I'm really bashing my keys, you know that you're not in the right state of mind. And so I'll often, I'll, I'll still bash it away and put it there, but put it away for 12 hours and then come back to it and decide whether or not that was actually the right thing to do. Deborah, that's such good advice, and that is so mm. true. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I've been caught a few times. Okay, so um, you came out of prison, and then what? <laughs> well, um, one, I, I, I mentioned I started a business. I was active mm. in several, and then I got really ill. And I had <laughs> lymphoma in 2000, late 2011 and 12, and um, I got it again. Uh, in April of, of 21, I, I knew on Easter Sunday, I was really sick. And I went in on Monday, and of course, they kept me for a week, and then I started chemotherapy the next week. And I had known from the depths of my trials before I went to prison, I was going to write a book. <clears throat> and um, a woman who runs a large speakers bureau said, you should write a book. And I said, Gail, I'm not that interesting. And then when you're in prison, and you read a lot of business books, you go. And I, when I reached back to her, I said, yeah, I'm still not that interesting, but I'm a lot more interesting than a lot of these other people, you know, effective. <laughs> and um, so when I was so sick and, and literally for um, a period of six weeks, I didn't really get out of bed. I, I credit four men with, say, with keeping me alive because I was so ill. In fact, if you talk to them individually, they would say they never thought I would make it through that right. because I only went to cancer. Then I got pneumonia. And um, so I wrote the book. I, I dictated it into an iPad. And uh, and that was, I knew what I was going to write. I just didn't know how. And when you're so sick and you got nothing but either you sleep or you wonder, and I'm not a TV watcher. So rather than spend, you know, dozens and dozens of hours of thinking about things I thought about for years in prison, started writing. And that was the book. Okay, wow. And so the book is called, I wrote it down here, The Grey Choice, yeah? And it's what it, um, I was just looking at what the tagline was, Big Time Banking to the Big House and Back. <laughs> um, and that you can obviously get hold of that on Amazon and all the usual places, is that right? Yes, ma'am, that is true. Yeah. And so writing the book, was it cathartic? I've always wondered about, you know, writing these things down. Does it, does it also, because you obviously do it with a desire to help other people, but was it also helpful for you? Well, it, my desire was, and I and I and I put this in the book that I wrote it so that hopefully those who read it will never make the mistakes I made mm -hmm. and experience the highs without the lows. But I didn't write it for what came out of it, and this is an irony. Uh, two men, one I've known for decades, another African American man at the time I'd known for about three years, both uh, broke bread with me a few weeks after it came out. Here, they both read the book. And they said this, and they were right. It cleansed me. I finally felt like I was, it was behind me. It felt like I was, you know, clean. I was ready to move forward. And that was not why I did it. But it was, that was a consequence. And it was ironic that I had two people tell me that from two different walks of life, both in business, so. And I'm like, wow, you all are right. But I didn't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. And 
And the other thing is, is, is I, I talked to friends that I grew up with. If you would have asked, I was always voted, you know, to be successful. But if they would have said, who's going to write a book in my class, I would have not been the person. And, and I tell people, and a lot, there's a saying, there's an inner book in everyone, but there's a lot of people who really should write them that choose not to. And it's not as hard in today's world as you would think. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you can make a difference in people's lives. And I've seen it from all kinds of people. I've gotten the most wonderful emails. And it's, it's one of the questions that somebody asked me early on. And I said, I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of emails and responses and, only two of them were negative, and they were both girls I dated in college and didn't marry. <laughs> Bit of an ulterior so, motive there. <laughs> so obviously, it's been freeing, but it's nice to have people. And I have people, obviously, that I don't know that have nothing to do with banking or finance just write and say, thank you. And, um, and I would have never thought that would have been a consequence, ever. Mm. That's fantastic. I, I want to go back a little bit as well, because I, um, I know that in the beginning you said that you actually lost friends and family and hurt friends and family, obviously, with what happened to you. How did you repair those relationships? Did you? Have you been able to? Um, and, and what was their what was their judgment? Like, Why did the, the, the relationship even break down in the first place? Um, one thing I was told all my life and now I've lived it you really can count all your friends on one hand. Mm -hmm. And um, that was one thing. The other thing is, is that my children had only seen success after success after success. And so I've had to deal with that. And, and it's repairing in some cases has been easy. And in other cases, it's, you know, it'll be the rest of my life or certainly beyond, but I know it'll happen. I, I have no doubt that it won't be. But what's been the, the, the ironic part of that is, is once you've been down the road, I've been down, you become a little gun shy of, you know, what's the response going to be is how many people who I wouldn't have called friends have risen just to unbelievable levels of acceptance and help and kindness. And it gives you a real good feeling about mankind. And you talked earlier about doing the greater good. And we all like to do that every day. We try to do it in our business life and our personal life. And when you've been through what I've been through, you find a whole lot of people who really are out there doing the greater good. And it's very refreshing. And um, so the, the ones I've damaged, it's a long road, but it's worth it. And, uh, and, and the ones that I haven't, they've just been unbelievably welcoming. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. You really have got those people around you who you know are there for you, come hell or high water. I, I haven't been through what you've been through, but I've certainly, um, I've lost everything in business. I've lost my house. I've lost my car. I've lost, you know, literally gone on. And, and as you said, I, <laughs> I don't know why, but I had to go back and start another business because that was part of my makeup and I couldn't bear the thought of going back. You know, my, my um, husband always says to me, why don't you go and get a, a, a real job with somebody? It's like, mm, yeah, actually, I prefer a real job of, of, of employing other people, if you don't mind. <laughs> But um, yeah, it is just it's it's interesting that the people you know your true friends, no matter what you go through, um, are there for you. Um, even when you've made some bad decisions, they will be there. They'll support you. Um, and others, I suppose, you can work on over time if you've done something to hurt them, which I think is probably where um, the, the biggest challenge lies. Is that fair? That is very fair. And yeah. I think sharing a bit about your story because you're you're only proof, living proof, of what I believe. When you get knocked down, it's not failure until you quit. Yeah. And when you get do it again, you you will succeed. I always love yeah. the books I read, the Thomas Edison story. He failed 9,999 times. Mm. That's a light bulb. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. Um, I, I don't just said, I think there's some certain things we'd like to help people avoid doing. I mean, I certainly would never recommend selling your house or your car to fund your business. But anyway, I did it. Um, what I do love about it is that I think that um, I think that sometimes, as, as you said, if you've always had successes, it's really hard to necessarily appreciate it as well. The one thing that I learned from being on literally the bones of my ass was that I now have a lot more um gratitude I think for the things that come into my life and, and I appreciate things like I never did before I might have been a bit of a sport brat in the old days whereas these days it's like I'm really grateful for for everything that happens <laughs>
Hey, look, we could probably talk all day because you've got such a, a fascinating kind of story, but I, I, I want the listeners to kind of walk away with some things they can actually use in their life. So do you have like three top tips or tools or um, things you'd like to share that we could actually share with the listeners? Yes, I am. Um, one is business and life is a constant. And I, and I said this, I learned this from mentors. All colleges in this country is it teach you how to learn. And if you're going to be successful in your personal life, you're going to, you have to constantly be willing to learn. And that's listening to podcasts like yours. That's reading. It's, it's devoting your life to constant learning. That's, that's number one. And that's what I love about podcasts because I'm, I, I can be on the treadmill. I can be, I can jog. I can be in the car. I can be bored at what I'm doing and I can listen to things. And I think that's so important. And that's again, back to technology. So mm. uh, that's number one. Number two is surround yourself with really bright people that will hold you accountable. And that's the key to success because when you've got somebody who's around you, who holds you accountable, you get a better result. It's like you were talking about boundaries. It's the same thing. Children want boundaries. Children want to be held accountable. You give them boundaries, you hold them accountable, you get a better result. Yep. And, um, and is it always the easiest thing? And uh, I, um, I was involved with a roofing company not long ago. And the young man said, I don't like it that every time we meet, you grade me. And then a few weeks later, he goes, I really like it that you do that because you made me a better person. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the intent wasn't to make him feel bad. It was to constantly be trying to help him improve. So yeah, surround to get people. I, um, I talk about that all the time. Is it people want to help you? Don't be afraid to ask them to help you. But don't get yes people. Mm. Get people who are counter. And the best people I've had in my management were people who were, the world would be very boring if it were all Sean's. It's getting people who think differently, act differently, talk differently, walk differently. And that's, <clears throat> that's number two. And number three, and, and, and you've already said this, it's take risks. If you don't take a risk, you're not going to better yourself or your company. You're not going to get the result. And, you know, it, you, you just, until you go out in the cold with no coat on or in the rain with no umbrella, or you do things that are, you know, just perceived to be risky in some regard, you're not going to kick the ball down the field and you have to take risks. Yeah. M- measured risks, perhaps, but yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, and I've, I've made some, I can just show you, I've been sitting here scribbling around my remark, but I've made so many notes of things that you've actually shared here. There's so many things that have been really sort of eye opening. And I think one of the things that kind of struck me is, you know, um, the, the whole thing about history, you know, as you said, there's been no new ideas in 10,000 years. So the ability to kind of keep learning from, from people and just listening um, and learning about history, I think is, is absolutely fine. And the, the grading thing, I just wrote that down as well. We actually, when I work with clients, so I actually get them to grade every quarter that they do. And the idea is that it's not about, you know making you feel good or bad it's just about actually well where are we what have we learned from it how do we improve and that's the way that you keep moving forward is to keep learning um, from the things that you could be doing better so thank you thank you so much for all of your beautiful wisdom um obviously we've talked about the book you can get hold of the book um, which is the great choice uh, on amazon and other places in terms of getting hold of you sean how would people get in contact with you if they wanted to talk to you i spell sean right deborah (laughs) s-h-a-u and it's Sean, <laughs> SeanHayes.com, H-A-Y-S. I love to say that because in college, there were three Seans in my fraternity, one a W, one an E-A, and I was a U. So I like to joke, <sighs> if, I'm, if I'm on the phone and somebody's named Sean, I say, they say, I say, well, you spell your name wrong. There is no wrong way, <laughs> H-A-U-N. So, and please feel free to have people reach out to me. And, and as I will always tell you, if I can ever help you in any way, don't hesitate to shoot me an email and we can get on a Zoom or whatever and and I'm there because business is about helping others succeed because usually if you help someone else, you benefit more than they did in reality. Absolutely true. I completely agree. Hey, look, thank you so much. And I know it's Sunday evening there for you. So again, thank you for, for giving up part of your weekend um, to spend time with me. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you and have a wonderful, a wonderful Monday. And uh, I, uh, I look forward to staying in touch with you and and thanks for sharing with me. Good night. Same here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the podcast show, Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry-Taylor.
I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my Entrepreneur's Playground and Event Centre in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.